We're live. Well, kind of live. We're recording now. <laughs> Very cool. Semi live. Well, yeah, semi live. Welcome back to the newly branded ZDS for Zach DeRo show from Zach Livestream. Um, Bram, we we had you on. We had you on. You were like one of my first guests, and it was I so awesome to have you. Twenty four, um, from the top of my head, not sure. Or twenty five. I don't know. You you were in the first round of interviews I did though. That when I realized, okay, interviews is really what I want the show to be about. So, uh, cool. Uh, really cool to have you back on. I remember then we were talking about forms and other things. <laughs> I honestly don't remember all everything we talked about, but I remember it being a really good conversation. So I'm 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 really looking forward to to this episode so we can like catch up on all the cool things you've been doing uh, since then. I know you've been, so I recently came across, um, I was just installing uh, Tailwind to one of my Angular projects that I'm doing yeah. on the side. And I, I'm pretty sure I saw your name on like the ng neat package for, for Tailwind for the schematics. And I'm yeah. guessing, I, I didn't look into to any of like the Git blames or anything like that. I'm guessing you had some hand to the edX schematics. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true. I don't think yes. I have, I did any commits, by the way, but um, oh, okay. I, I helped Chow along the way and um, Chow Tram, who did um, the integration, and um, I basically helped him migrate to NX with uh, support and motivation, let's put it that way. Very cool. So, now, you, you and Chow have been doing some stuff on uh, BLS, is that right? That's correct, yeah. So after, after being online on your show, I branded my show BLS, super original, as I am. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, Beam and Livestream, I think I got like 19 episodes since September, so that's pretty cool. And um, uh, Chow has been a resident, basically. He's been, I think, on four or five of my shows already. And uh, the last time was a three-part series on Component Store. So okay. that was um, super interesting. But I also had Alex on, I think, two times about the same Component Store. And uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty exciting, and I'm super excited about that. And Tailwind as well. So last time we chatted, I wasn't uh, sold on Tailwind. That okay. was like uh, it's just bootstrap with extra steps. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm since then I'm a convert, and uh, I now have to keep myself from migrating my existing apps all to like Tailwind and Component Store. Some stuff just as good as it is, and yeah. doesn't need a conversion. So. It was just just to convert it all to NX, and the rest will take care of itself later. I, most of my my pro, serious projects are NX, so that's mm. that's one thing that's basically a base. But um, yeah, now super excited about that, and um, Very cool. formally I, still still is a, a big thing. So I made a formally integration for Tailwind that I hope to publish somewhere start of new year. Very cool. So what 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 sold you on Tailwind after everything? Literally the course that um, Adam, the the maker of uh, Tailwind, has on his website. I okay. think it's on YouTube right now. It's he shows how to use it. It literally sold me because after watching the whole show, I went to Tailwind UI and I bought the package. They have like oh. a, they offer a, a package with a whole lot of templates. Super well done. And uh, he literally sold me. I was like, I want to support this dude. I want to support this project, and I need this in my life. And um, yeah. Very cool. Now, now, I was already a big fan of Bootstrap for years. I've been using Bootstrap since version one, and um, mm. I really like the idea of not having to write CSS, just apply classes, and this takes it to a whole other level. Mm. And uh, and leaving you with a super tiny bundle uh, as a result, which is, I think, one of the biggest uh, pros. Like, if you you can have a, a well designed site and have like thirty k of styles, that's it. Yeah. And uh, whereas if you add like Bootstrap and Font Awesome, as I did before, you have like 500k easily. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a huge huge win in that that set. Yeah, good deal. You know, yeah. I, I I lamented in one of my recent articles. Um, in our world, unfortunately, performance all comes down to initial bundle size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. this this is the world we live in. But yeah, yeah, any way you can easily cut that down, that's. Uh, it's definitely yep. a huge plus. Do you find? Do you feel like um, it's easier to work with now that you you're accustomed to Tailwind? I feel like for me, I'm I'm not. I I feel like my CSS skills are subpar. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have a decent like knack or intuition for what looks good, 
but yeah. I, I have a hard time actualizing that with with you know my own CSS. Um, Tailwind looks really attractive to me because of well maybe because of some of the reasons you mentioned, it's like being able to have some templates where I can just say. Let me start from the template and, you know, someone else took care of most of the styling considerations yeah. for me. Uh, that would, that could be huge. So I think one of the benefits is it makes it easier to do the right thing just by having mm. some, some set defaults and not let you like fiddle around with details. For instance, uh, sizing, margins, paddings, all that jizz. If mm. you have just a scaled set of paddings, you'll never do it. You can hardly ever do it wrong. And, um, like in my apps, I, Oh, I need to connect my sounds. In my apps, I generally end up with like, okay, I'm using margin margin three and margin six on large devices, right? So you have some responsive idea. Just apply that throughout and your whole app starts to look already more like in sync, like it's built by the one person with, with an intent. But I think the video that uh, Adam did, and again, I'm, I highly recommend it and we should definitely link it below. Um, that really showed me why you make certain design decisions. And as a result, my app started looking better, even the ones that didn't use, that use Bootstrap, because you can do a lot of things with Bootstrap as well, part paddings, shadows. Like throwing a shadow on a card never occurred to me. Bootstrap has it, I didn't never used it, but it it's just a subtle touch and it makes it like better. It, it's like, ah, like this, this pops up a little bit. And uh, as a result, my Bootstrap apps have been looking better since I started using Tailwind because I now got a better idea. I like, ah, oh, you can use this trick and, and why we make certain decisions. I think your audio is on mute, Zach. Is that better? Uh, yeah, there. yeah, that's better. <laughs> that works way better. Thanks, man. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that, that's super cool. Um, yeah, I, I, need to, I need to get around and you know, mess around with some tailwinds more. I, I definitely want to check out that link now that you mentioned it too. Um, yeah. Just in terms of like seeing seeing everything um, Tailwind can offer, and and absolutely the bundle size. Uh, I don't I don't like thinking about it. So if there's any way I can instantly yeah. save ninety percent of the bundle size on styles, that sounds that sounds like a good deal. So oh, yeah. totally, totally, totally a great thing um, to have. And so then I figured like oh, I can do this bird CSS with Bootstrap as well. So I started thinking about it. And then I was mm. like, well, yeah, but now I'm really just reinventing something because I'm used to bootstrap. Mm -hmm. So then I basically, thanks to Chow's plugin, uh, it was good. It didn't work with NX though. So that's one of the reasons I pushed, like, I think if you build it in NX as an NX plugin, it will work in both. Mm. Um, so that got me rolling. And, um, so one of the things to, to, that's interesting. So, uh, Tailwind has the at apply directive or function, not sure how to call it. So you can basically say, hey, give me a, make a class called BTN button and mm -hmm. give it these styles. Which means that if you have an app built in Bootstrap and you're using classes already all over the place, what you can do basically is polyfill Bootstrap. So you say, mm -hmm. you know what? I got, I using cards all over the place. Yeah. I don't want to go through my app and, and search and replace all my cards and replace it with this large string of classes that Tailwind needs. Yeah. But you Let can me go, go in and sim that over to yeah you can go in your global style and you say oh, you know what uh, a dot btn right now is these amounts of styles and go yeah. ahead and apply it and so that makes the conversion if somebody wants to do conversion bootstrap to it it's pretty straightforward yeah. using this strategy and you can basically reuse your templates and then migrate to other stuff down yeah the line. it's really interesting yeah and uh yeah i'm sold as you can hear very cool very cool yeah um let's let's talk about component store a little bit um this is something you know i, I had i had alex on not not long after it first came out i i was actually i think i was on uh seattle js right when it was first coming out the component store with um did that come out with ngrx 10 i think so yes yeah i don't think they've come out with ngrx 11 yet I don't know if they're going to keep up with Angular from here on out or not. But. I think uh, it's it's on the verge of being released. I saw something oh, okay. tweeted about it today, but um, yeah, they're a bit behind numbering wise. Yeah, we we were uh, NX was a little bit behind too. We were a couple of weeks. Usually we lag only a few days, but um, you know, yeah, it just came at an interesting time this year. But um, but yeah, uh, so component store. 
Here's my understanding of it, because, you know, Alex and I had a conversation about it. Um, I, I heard his presentation on it in um, at CLJS. So um, component store seems to me to be like a toolkit around creating a service with a subject um, to give you some guardrails to kind of standardize that process of, you know, um, managing that behavior subject for you. So you're not... Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, being a contractor, uh, I go into a lot of places where you see the service and with with the with the behavior subject, and it just gets uh, it just gets really uh, interesting quick. Yeah, that's 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 a good word. Well, the, it's it's yeah. the nature of the problem, right? Like yeah. state in general, I think is yeah. this black hole of potential complexity, and you're yeah. you just gotta do everything you can to guard yourself against that. So having some standard library with tools specifically for that purpose seems really cool. Yeah. What, what I have a hard time uh, figuring out a good use case for it is maybe I'm just so used to the, like the global NGRX store pattern that I have a hard time finding like a really good use case for using like uh, a service with a subject or a component store implementation. Whereas I would prefer uh, to just go to, you know, just NGRX store, the sort of the, the horse I know how to ride, you know? Yeah. No, I totally um, hear that. I, I haven't been, so I've been using NGRX global store since, well, when it came out, I was super interested and I converted mm -hmm. all my apps and then I did a ton of things wrong. So mm -hmm. I shot myself in the foot with that a ton of times. And then yeah. back in February, I had Look, to chant. can I can I ask you what what were the ways you shot yourself in the foot? If that's not too embarrassing, because no 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 not at all. Interested in that? I think I think a lot of people is happens just throwing way too much into one store and trying mm -hmm. to micromanage it all, having like one big global store that does it all, mm -hmm. and then and and basically trying to fight the whole pattern instead of embracing it, which mm -hmm. is something I, I I learned down the line, and when I got started you didn't have all these sweet create selectors and create effect methods. So there was a lot of manual code to be written. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that all often ended up in apps that did work and that had nice replay functionality and an and a and a inspector. But in fact, added a lot of complexity that we don't need. Yeah. Now and then, uh, so I started using it less and less and actually started to do way more um, focused services with a subject mm. to handle just like, okay, I got one component. I need to visit this. That is not global at all. It just like, give me a list of products and I want to be able to add a new one, delete one, refresh one gets deleted, basic mm. behavior like this. And I found myself doing something that component store does better, but I re-implemented it a dozen times. So it's slightly different each time. And this is exactly what you, it's a, it's like a structure on top of service with a subject. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I needed. I, I never knew I needed it, but now I do know. Mm -hmm. And um, I also do work in React. I, as a contractor, I like it's 50-50 uh, React and Angular work. And now when I'm in React, I'm like, ah, I wish I had a component mm. store. <laughs> and <laughs> like nice. it's, it's all RxJS based and I know React and RxJS and it's not natively supported and um, I cannot, there's not an async operator that's basically essential to the idea. Yeah. So I, I've, I've kept myself from trying to port it over or play with it. But um, yeah, for me, it's definitely something that changes how I think about apps. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, th I guess if you're using components, if you're using global store all the way and that's the way to go, that's probably gonna be the main route for you there's there's also little reason to to like refactor it out mm -hmm. but uh, yeah i've been using it for everything like for instance auth mm -hmm. because in the end i think the name component store is a bit deceiving in the fact that like yeah, it's it's generally used to back a component mm -hmm. but there's no reason you can say oh, it's provided in root and now you just have a global store you just have yeah. a global service and a subject and in my latest app that i'm working on over the weekend um I'm using it as an authentication solution and I just mm. got a global store and uh, I can inject it from anywhere. There's no orchestration. You don't need to do a for root at any place. It's just really a simple, simple thing to add to your, to your app. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I found like, um, 
uh, uh, sort of in my, my personal uh, code bases. I find, so I, I really enjoy using um, Firebase. So have you used Angular Firebase at all? Yeah, definitely. Cool. It, so I, I've, got, I've come up with some different ways of like, like getting their auth stuff into the store, right? Into into the global store with just some actions around like listening to their like the uh the user observable that they expose. So listening yeah. to changes on that. If I ever hear a change, let's let's go ahead and put that in the store. It always feels a little bit off <laughs> to me. Because like your store is supposed to be your your you know you know, your your global source of truth. Mm-hmm. And here it's clearly not. Here is clearly replicated state from, yeah. from where where the be, where the source of truth is actually inside of this um, you know Firebase auth package. I'm just kind of like chaining that over to my store. Now so. this, I, I suppose, happens in an effect, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I would just have something where I listen to the effect, and like I'll have an effect um, to like sign users in anonymously and that kind of stuff. And yeah. when I do see, uh, I'll just create an effect that listens to the user. Whenever that user changes, I'll dispatch a different event based on the way that user changed. Right. Right. So yeah. that's that's pretty much how I'd recreate it. Um, and that's always been a little problematic to me, right? Because it's not. It's again, it's just a reflection of yeah. some existing state somewhere else. But I'm actually like. Um, uh, in general, I think NGRX is really cool because derive state has a solution built in via selectors, right? Like yeah. the, what's actually in your store should be your global data. Like that that solid data that you're pointing to is this is my source of truth. And as soon as you get into this weird state where you're syncing that or something else with other services or other pieces of your app, things can get things can get uh, dicey. So, so the, one of the things that's interesting, this is like, it's awesome to work with people like Chow who have, uh, Chow's work with a lot of other um, state solutions as well. So he brings mm. more knowledge and use cases to the table. So for instance, you can basically, how do you say, you can have a selector that re-emits an existing observable. So you can say, I think it will work if you say, just give me inject in, uh, Angular Fire, uh, Angular Fire, auth mm-hmm. and basically pipe the, the what is it auth state pipe, pipe the auth state add a pipe and say okay this is logged in or not logged in depending on you have a user right because and this is something that was really blowing my mind it's a whole cha- this component store is a whole chain of observables or it's probably even one observable chain but like you don't need to subscribe you don't need to think about it you don't it's, as long as you pass in observables and you keep doing that chaining them along it magically mm-hmm. works Mm. And uh, so this has been interesting because, for instance, in my auth, my global auth component store, yeah, this 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 is user info I want to use at some places. Of course, you want to be able to get whatever user you have and, and do something with this. Right now, because of the nature it's just a service and they are provided at root, so I can just inject this service in the component store and say, mm-hmm. oh, you know what, I need this user information at this moment and uh, just select it and, and give it to me. So it gets a very natural natural way to think about these things. Nesting them hasn't been something that came to my mind, but it's super nice. And actually in the component store demo that, that Chow and I built, mm-hmm. he does a he builds an awesome um, workflow builder where they nest um, component stores. It's super nice. It's it's a very a very nice solution for that uh, that 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 use case as well. And yeah, as said, I think off camera, I find it hard to find use cases for the global store anymore because I wasn't really? already using it that often. Yeah. And then I can delete, <laughs> I can delete like eight files and leave with one super nice, super yeah. clean, testable service. Mm. And, it, and it does the same, but it, it has a, it gives a better feeling because I'm sure like there's no edge cases to take into account. So. Yeah. It's interesting. So I actually uh, recently I've started uh, just doing all my NGRX stuff in in one file <laughs> because so with with sort of the the simplification of things since eight yeah um, it's kind of easy to do that like yeah I just have like actions at the top and then some selectors down below and then the reducer and just kind of yeah. go from there um, so yeah and it's it's usually it's hardly like unmanageable to work with that anyways but um yes yeah, 
So it's interesting for you to bring that up because I'm, I'm having like the exact opposite problem, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like just finding a hard hard case to use the, the component store as opposed to the global one. Um, yeah. I, I want to latch on to something you had mentioned about, um, well, so so you you had mentioned selectors. Are you, are you thinking, I, I haven't gone too deep in component store. Are there, is there a concept of selectors in component store as well? Yeah. Okay. So it has the select method, so you can say this dot select, and it takes a method. So it takes state, and you can say, if, let's say you have wallets. I'm working on a on a, a, a digital wallet right now. You have a yeah. wallet object of wallet. You can mm -hmm. say, give me wallet uh, wallet dollar sign equals this dot select, and you get state state of wallet. So you can take one slice, but instead of taking just state, it also takes other observables. So you can mix mm -hmm. and match. So you can say, okay, I got. Like for instance, loading, error, saving, whatever. I got a few toggles on there. Mm -hmm. You can map, you can select these into making another selector. Cool. So you and can you can kind of like that the concept of a selector from like NGRX is kind of being brought in. You can pretty much throw that onto any observable source. Yeah. Now. Yeah. That's really cool. I actually like that a lot. That that it exactly solves my problem that I was <laughs> talking about before with the. Uh, with the uh, Firebase auth yeah. stuff, so I think Very Firebase cool. auth, and I'm I'm tempted to uh, to give it a shot afterwards. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> I'm yeah definitely. I got some projects uh, with it actually. I, I use it quite a bit for prototyping. I think mm. it's the quickest way to, to add some Absolutely. data layer. Oh yeah, auth. yeah, yeah. Especially if you want to keep everything in sync. Those web <laughs> those web sockets they give you are super yeah. nice, man. I really now, like that. We built the initial pro uh, component store demo backed with Firebase just mm. because how easy it is. But we actually had to stop using the, the observable nature of Firebase because that would basically uh, stop having the need for a solution that's pool based. That's mm. basically, okay, give me the new list of items. So we, did, we would say, Firestore, give me all the collection and just take one. Stop mm. the observable right now because we don't want you to, do, to be so eager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we now migrated it to, and it's using um, an index DB in your browser, so it's, oh, cool. Very it doesn't cool. use any backend. So if you like, I can give it a, a, a quick show. I can give it a, a quick demo, or we can yeah. Um, let's let's take a look at it real quick. Um, do you have? Do you want to share your screen here? Yes, I'm gonna go ahead and share this one. There we go. Um, so. Component Store Playground, this is the latest version that got deployed, built with an X. And um, so there's two main things in the app. I started with the most simple thing. And what I wanted is a demo of the most simple um, simple application we know. It's a to-do list. So you can add it to hello ZDS, and then um, this gets stored in IndexedDB. You can add another one, and it can toggle and it can filter and that's about it and when you have like a big filter you can remove the filter and this is all backed by component store so uh, if we want to take a look and i think the best place to look is just at the uh, github repo mm -hmm. and i'm going to bump this up quite a bit and i'm just going to look for workflow no to do's store to do store and the to-do's component. Now the to-do's component HTML is quite quite big because we didn't abstract anything out. We didn't create a lot of components. But We're all one component here. It looks. Like. Yep, it's the one <laughs> component fine. army. Yeah, 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 yeah. We do have some things like having a form abstraction and uh, a loading. So nice detail. This this input box is powered by Formly. So this is just defined. You won't f see any inputs in our template. Mm -hmm. That's uh, nice. Right here. And uh, well, and, and we can jump in that and see how that's done. Basically, say this is my form, pass in the, the form group that you all know and love, and pass in my array of fields. And it, the rest of it, it's all handled. Now, and then uh, I want to quickly look at the component class, to do's class. Now you see, okay, uh, the, the basics here uh, change detection on push, and then we provide the store. Mm -hmm. And then the body, and this is what I like most about it. This is just remapping it to the to, to do store. There's no logic in here. It's right. just basically, hey, trigger, do this, trigger, do that. 
And this is something that I think I, I see all my components moving this way. And this is a smart component. Yeah. Bear in mind, this is not a dump uh, representational component. Yeah. So this this looks a lot like the the stuff I like to write too, which is like I'll have um, methods that are like bound to like the click event on buttons or yeah. lifecycle hooks. I just have the store injected, and the store will dispatch some action yeah. associated with it. So yeah. this looks like very much the same thing, just rather than dispatching an action, we're calling a method on our to-do store, right? Yep, totally. Same mental model, same idea, same things to keep in mind, same things to, to love. And uh, mm -hmm. now the component store itself, this is where we define the state. So we have an array of to-dos and we say if we're saving and we're doing the filter here. Mm -hmm. Now let's start with the first one, which is the form. Form group, I just define an empty form group and I define an array of fields. In this case, it's just one. And I got a form helper that creates a field. So this is this is how you define a field in this app. Mm. Form field. This is Not this is super interesting to me, Bram, because this is something you you can't and don't want to do with with a global store, right? Like you don't yeah, want no. you you can't put you can't put a, a form object in the in the store to start with because it's not serializable. But yeah. um but uh, this is not this is not kept in state, right? This is just a, a property on the service here. Right. So I got a, a service, it's just a property, and instead of instead of having it here in the component mm -hmm. where you would use to have like an array of fields, right. I basically moved it out because why why bother? Right. And this I think is one of the key things. So what we say here, uh, we basically make a query observable that basically takes the value changes with a debounce and it plugs and see like there's no subscribe here. We just take this as a mm -hmm. observable. And then at some point, and I, I think that's down here. Yep. Here we say in the constructor, this update filter when this query updates. So we basically pipe in our form uh, value query into the update filter. And this is a very simple reducer function that basically say, okay, set the filter to this. And uh, we're using Immer here. That's mm. uh, something that Chow brought on the table. Uh, and, th and this again, it's like, it, there's almost no code. This is nice. Like this is, it works as expected. You say, okay, this is your effect. And actually the only thing the effect does is what normally would do a reducer, takes a value and updates the value. Mm -hmm. So super clean here. And then this is an effect. Uh, so these are actually not effects. These are updaters. So they just update a value. And then here we have an effect, loads to do's. Uh, it's just a trigger. It doesn't take any any options. Here we take something from the, uh, from the store and we do our switch map and we handle, handle our error and the response. And I think, I mean, if, if you're new to it, it's like, okay, might be, might be quicker ways to do this exact component, but there's quite a lot of things going on here that all work in sync. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. So I, I, I like this pretty much. And here I think we can see how you can uh, reselect basically. So these are three selectors that I make to do dollar sign saving and filter, basically the three items from state that we have. Mm -hmm. So we're exposing this here, and this is a selector. And now this view model here, this is what combines them. So you say, okay, this view model, select these three ones, make them available as first property, second property, third property, and this is what you expose. And now here, this is basically where our select, it's a bit messy in this app because you would you would most likely pull this one out to a sub-selector as well. So yeah. I would... But um, this view model is what gets exposed to the front end. And this is what, um, what is actually the, the, the thing we're consuming. So we can just say in the component template, mm -hmm. the, every template starts with this. Yeah. You subscribe to it and then VM, VM dot. So here you can say is loading, is empty. Yeah. You know, this would be a perfect use case for the NGRX let directives, a structural directive. But I find myself doing this anyways too. <laughs> it's just I'm so used to it. It's hard to it's hard to switch. But, but how would the uh, syntax be different? So just ngrx let and then vm dollar sign svm, right? Yep. It would uh, get rid of the dollar async. Yep. And then yeah. the, the, of course the this is not a problem with its uh, since it's an object coming through the view model anyways, right? But um, it's never going to be empty. 
Yeah, it's never going to be yeah. empty. It's never going to yeah. be falsy. So yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll always have it. So there's no no uh, no reason not to do it. So. No, I definitely agree. And and when Alex told me this, my first reaction was, and what if it's it's falsy, right? That was my internal reaction. Like now you're wrapping your whole component and you cannot do error handling. It's, my it's an object. <laughs> it's an object. And my, my empty state and all that just got so much better by using a pattern. Mm -hmm. For, so for me, it's like the thing I always needed and I never knew I needed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then the the more advanced example is, so I started with this to-do list and I built it and I gave it the name Component Store Playgrounds. And Chow and I were talking about this quite a bit. And uh, mm. I was like, why do you want to collaborate on this? Because he worked with a more advanced example in his work, a workflow builder, condition builder is what they call it. Now I got a, a demo workflow here, but the idea is basically that you can have groups and you can, you always start out with one main group, which is your workflow. And then you can add various groups and inside here you can add conditions. Mm. And uh, you can save these and then later retrieve them. And this is all backed by a component store. So then we can say here, allow deletion, and then we can delete an item. This goes actually up into the parent store. And there's a, a store for the groups and a store for conditions and it all works in harmony. And it's a super easy and, and nice way to do it. There is uh, things like deserialization of the tree into a flat map and uh, restructuring it back into an object to send it to the DB and it's all handled in component store. So definitely mm -hmm. check this out if you're interested in it. It's in my GitHub uh, bman slash component store playground where you can check it out. And, Very uh, cool. It just migrated to an X. So that's even a better reason to check it out, right? Always, always a good reason to check it out. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, the last last thing we got a um, uh, nice the team picture in there because yeah, it's uh, um, one of my first Tailwind projects and it supports dark mode since version two. This one is backed by a component store, so I started writing my theme service, which I was doing like normally, and then when I wrote new behavior subject, I was like, hmm. Hmm. Shouldn't, shouldn't this be a component store? <laughs> and I talked to Chow and he was like, of course it should be a component store because you're managing some state in a service. So yeah. we made it global and um, we do some nice stuff with with managing. It has uh, it hooks into the local storage, so it stores your preference if you do a refresh. And then last part, which I'm super happy, excited about, for those of you that are not using Formly and know you actually should, this is a super nice demo. I think it's super nice of all the form fields that are there by default. This mm. is what I use to, to re-implement it. And I basically re-implemented all the functionality that um, the Bootstrap integration has. So you can do like dynamic add-ons here. This is all de declarative, right? So you don't write any HTML to get this mm -hmm. in here. Uh, you can do some advanced form layouts just using uh, Flexbox inside your form definitions all declaratively and uh, well, the basic login form. So definitely mm. check it out. This demo implements all the, for the fields itself. So there's no black box here. You can just see, oh, you know what? This text area, how did you build it as a formly field? So um, yeah, this is, this is pretty exciting. And I've been using this now as a, as a, as a main starter for my forms. Very cool. So um, yeah, definitely check it out. I think for, for that, uh, we, we touched on all the parts in the demo. Next up, what I'm going to build here is a payment wizard. So I'm doing a payment, um, a payment uh, processing uh, wizard, if you will. Uh, so that's one. And um, I got some other fun stuff up my sleeve that I'm going to going to build in here soon. So, uh, but yeah, definitely check it out and give it a thumbs up if you like it. Very cool. And I'll make I'll make sure we uh, we link that in the in the about below too for yep. the for this episode when it hits on YouTube. Um, cool. I, I want to latch on to something you, you we were talking about uh, just previously, though, with the view model. Um, so the the view model uh, sort of exposing that. So you were doing that via a selector in the component store there. Yeah. Um, so this this kind of maps to something I had been thinking about in the past. I never got around to writing an article on this. I, I think I might want to try to reprise it. But um, I had this idea for... Um, sort of this view model approach to writing components where every, like, <laughs> I think it's very similar to component store, really, especially looking at what you were just showing, where every component would just, if it had any kind of state, any kind of anything associated with it, you just create a service right alongside that component. 
And that would, that service would act almost as like an adapter to that component to anything in the outside world with the idea being like, if you just wanted to test that component, just completely mock out just that one, that one service designed specifically for that component. And you can kind of figure out, it's kind of like, it's almost like any, any component can become dumb, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and, and then you're just moving kind of the, the logic of it into, into that service. Um, I think you could probably do something similar with the component store. Um, but, but recently one thing I've been doing too, is just, um, I'll have, I'll do like the NGRX store. So like the classic, uh, the classic store, I guess, store classic. And, um, I'll, I'll, you know, oftentimes not everything's in the, in the store, right? Like, uh, going back to the Firebase auth, maybe if I just wanted to say, you know, my auth slice of store is a lie anyways, I'll just, I'll just use like auth right out of the box. Like, uh, yeah. like a sane person would maybe, <laughs> um, uh, if, if I wanted to do something like that, I could do something where I just have somewhere else, um, maybe in a file, like a sibling file to that component. Um, just something that says create view model, uh, a function that takes in some things that you'd be injecting into the component anyways. Uh, usually the store would be a big one of it, but then you could also do like the, the auth service coming right out of Firebase if you wanted and just yeah. have, have those things come into the function, return an observable of some view model. You just define an interface right there in the file. And, uh, I think it gets you very close to what you're talking about. The, the problem with that though, I think is RxJS is a very complicated and complex beast and you don't want to kind of go at that without having some tools in hand, right? Um, so it looks yeah. like it looks like from what I was looking at of your code just briefly there, like uh, Component Store really gives you some great tools for not having to write a lot of RxJS code. Because that's that's one thing I'll do if, yeah. I, if I use this pattern, I'm like, I'm paranoid almost in my testing. Like I want to use marble diagrams on everything. Make sure this, this view model is behaving exactly as I expect it to, which one of the things I'm, I'm opening my eyes to as I get more and more with ArxJS, which I love, by the way, I love ArxJS, but there's so many dimensions to this thing. Like yeah. when it completes, um, what, what kind of behavior, what kind of strategy, like incoming observables are, are behaving in, like, is it a behavior strategy or replay strategy or just a regular subject strategy? I don't know. It gets, yeah. it gets really complicated really quick. Um, so having, having something like that, and, and this was one of the big draws to me to NGRX, uh, when I first was attracted to, I always thought, you know. NGRX is a way I don't have to do Mart's RxJS in my app, right? Like I, I have my selectors, I'll just pipe async onto them. That's that's yeah. that's the extent of my RxJS I need to do, right? Yeah, but in your so. effects, you still would need um, yeah a fair bit. Effects of get tricky. <laughs> effects yeah. get yeah, tricky. Yeah. No, but, I mean, um, I basically the counter example plus plus mm. plus and minus minus. That's just reducer, right? So that's super mm. straightforward. I think like one of the things that was that first opened my eyes was a, an, a talk, I think, by Victor about optimistic updates using NGRX. I think it's called yes. something like this. It's like two or three years back uh, in Angular Connect, I think he, I saw mm. it. And uh, this is what, what he explains is uh, like, yeah, you can do it this way. You're probably not thinking about a lot of edge cases, which is why the NX has this awesome uh, fetch I think it's a fetch pipe or fetch run pipe where you basically say, uh, run this code and handle my error. So it always makes sure you handle your error. And this is something, ah, you know what? I always ignored this. And then when people, like when you see your app doesn't work or you're hacking some toast somewhere that something went wrong, that like you at least display something. <laughs> it's like I was, doing, I was doing this pretty wrong the whole time. Mm. And, uh, but yeah, I think you still need quite a little a bit of knowledge. So with regards to testing, I classically don't test a lot. I know it's bad. I don't. Um, a lot of people ask me for pay me for building prototypes, which generally don't really demand tests. They just give me something that works. So this yeah. is my the mode which I'm basically in. For the component store playground, Chow did an awesome job. After we migrated to Next, he started doing the tests because we had access to Jest and Cypress. Very and, cool. Um, so you're in for a treat here. I think maybe today or tomorrow we're going to land in all the tests for all the component stores here, and they use marble tests and uh, 
Marble tests, yes. Yes. <laughs> Marble tests and, are amazing because every one of those uh, dimensions that RxJS brings in, you can test those and make yeah. sure everything's exactly as they should be with Marble tests, which yeah. is a really cool way of thinking about that. But yeah, and, and super yeah. cool to hear you talk about NX that way too, just because I've thought very much <laughs> the same thing. Like our, our blech, NX makes coding better because it makes these tools that much more accessible without having to think yeah. about configuring them so yeah totally and and like if i use um if i use ngrx which i i still do in some apps like some if you want to continue the same app it's probably best to use the same pattern that i'm using already hmm. and not throw in one component store and have to rest all of an <laughs> ngrx yeah. when i do i still scaffold out the i use the um, nx and the nx provided scaffold which has uh, a lot of nice things and um yeah, now it's it's both and it's both great stores, and I think it, there's definitely use cases you can use them um, next to each other. There's also something yeah. that Alex keeps on repeating, like you can use them in conjunction. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really see the, the the use case in my apps, but I'm definitely interested in in seeing that. And also, if somebody yeah. sees this and wants to hop on uh, a live stream with me on showing it, how or why to use them in tandem, be my guest. Just reach out on Twitter, and I'll. I'll happily host a show about this. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, so one of the big one of the big things for me with NGRX has been has always been thinking of like your actions as like this this event stream, like yeah. sort of like a water main for for your entire application. Yeah. It feels like some of that is maybe lost a little bit in the component store. Is that is that a fair statement or no? Yeah, I think you you're cutting out. A few, uh, one or more, maybe more layers of indirection, where you just basically, for instance, you call the updater directly. I see it like this is as, as yeah. if you would call one statement in your reducer directly. If you can say, "Hey, execute this part of the reducer," this this single method in my reducer, just execute it with this value, and and hmm. and don't forget it, forget about the rest. Yeah. So I, one of the other patterns I see. So I. I think most of us have like quite an evolving pattern of software, right? You write certain yeah. things, then you learn a new pattern or a new idea, you reapply it and you fall into the traps and you fix them. And this mm. is like iteration. And um, on BLS, I've been with uh, Lars Brink three times and we talked about NX structure and uh, this has been super helpful for me. And what he promotes there is the structure that Narwhal promotes in their book, Angular Monorepos, uh, mm. Enterprise Angular Monorepos, which is having four types of libraries, data access feature, util, and UI. And that's it for a front end. Mm -hmm. now, I rebuilt my whole app this way. And data access used to be quite chubby, quite a fat uh, library generally, because it had like a service, a mm -hmm. module. It had my whole NGRX state, and it had all the stuff. And my features would ask everything from the data access. Now, with this pattern, I started out with like, okay, store data access needs to go in data access, but I found myself flipping around and actually I came to the conclusion now oh, it needs to sit right next to the component where I use it because it doesn't make sense to split it out. It's, it's tied to this component and, and other way around. And then because I use GraphQL in my backends and I use GraphQL code generator, I actually mm -hmm. don't need this service layer in between. I can just inject whatever service gets generated by GraphQL and use it straight away. I can just use yeah. my generated SDK that's already a service that already does everything well. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in the last in the last app I've been doing this weekend, I don't generate any data access libraries for um, for my front end lips hardly. Like some big ones, yeah, authentication, sure. That's a complicated yeah. one. But the other ones, like all my utility, my features, I I just skip them. It's all it's a feature with a smart store. Mm -hmm. And then it's a UI yeah. library with some dump components. And it's uh, it's really a big cleanup in this in this sense. It's like okay, I I can do more with less code. Yeah, yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's better also. Like it really forces me to rethink my patterns and I like dumping mm. the dumping my form fields in this store. First, initially, I was like, oh, this is so dirty. But then I was like, well, why? You know, it's yeah. in the end, my form elements are JSON objects. Yeah, and they are serializable as long as you don't put any fancy stuff in them. So as long as you don't have any like inline validators probably, but that's that's a bit of an edge case. Yeah. Um, but having them in my store also makes me, allows me to do fancy stuff like um, easily tie into a lookup. If you, let's say, 
you want to do a check if your username is available. Just have an yeah. async validator. Right. It's super easy in the store. It's it, because it's all there already, and it's it's all an observable already. And if I need to format it, ah, okay, I'll write a quick um, selector that re-exposes it and 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 basically pipes it and formats it. So, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll need to dig around with that a little bit more. Um, I've always thought of forms as you know. I've I've uh, last time we talked to you, you had pitched formally very hard. I, I've not had an occasion yet to to dig into it, so I apologize for that. No but, worries. Um, I've always thought of like forms as being a really really good tool for managing local state um, and kind of having this um, having this idea of like forms go in local state. Those are local to your components. Yep. They stay in there. Um, yep. Other pieces of state like username. Username seems like a very global thing. You're going to probably need that in several different places throughout your app. That's a good thing to go in. You know your your global store, your NGRX store, totally. and then you use NGRX to glue those uh, to take those two puzzle pieces and like stick them together. Um, and and seeing seeing a tool like Component Store come out now, it, it seems like a way. It seems like a a board to put your puzzle pieces on. Maybe yeah. like. Um, it was kind of kind of interesting. Definitely so in one of my last streams, uh, yeah. I I did um sometimes I do a Saturday night live stream, which basically was the idea of like I'm not gonna plan anything, I'm just gonna sitting here. It's like Saturday night, ten o'clock, wife's wife's in bed, and then I'm like, yeah. okay, let's just go ahead and, and do something and stream it. So this is something that, that got created. And in one of them I um explain how to build this uh, Tailwind Formula UI library from scratch. So basically re-implement whatever I did, start with an empty app, install Formly, yeah. use an input field and make it fail. Like it said, hey, I can't find this input. Okay, let's build the input and let's make sure Formly is happy. So that's, that's I think, pretty nice to have. And uh, in there, I say, well, you can, uh, Formly is actually a component renderer. And uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic component renderer. You say, okay, I register this component, render it with these parameters and it renders it out and it happens to be used as forms and it needs to have the concept of a form group but in essence you're rendering out piece of ui so it's not limited to inputs at all mm -hmm. and i say you can probably build your whole ui using formally i wouldn't recommend it this is my li me literally <laughs> telling it and then i i kept thinking about this like i wouldn't recommend it well actually why wouldn't i and um start thinking about it more Hmm. And then a few days back, I'm on with a friend of mine. We're doing a call. We're looking at his app using Formly. And he was like, yeah, I recall you saying it, and I'm going to try it. I was like, yeah, I might. So actually, I started trying it out. And I started building a tree component, like hmm. the one you see in StackBlitz or in your VS Code, just a, a, a file tree mm -hmm. as a Formly component. Because it's an observable. And if you think about it, if you flatten it out, it's basically a select box with a multiple. Select. You have like one option to select or you have multi select, but it's still either one value or multiple values. Yeah. And you just kind of recursively go off of that kind of node yeah. component. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, and then on the back, I use the Angular CDK for the tree control. So I don't oh, okay. even re implement it. But my formally field wraps around this tree component, takes mm -hmm. in an observable. And if you click one, it updates your field value because it's still it's a form input. Mm -hmm. So you have like uh, you have your form field value being the path of the file you selected. So this mm. you can then trigger like okay, open up the file or, or do something. Yeah. And That's from really looking cool. at it, and um, I think I'm pretty much onto something to build like a nice sidebar, the one you find in your editor, where you have like a collapsible sidebar, and one pane is the file tree, and the other pane is maybe some some other settings panel or whatever. Mm. Just how you do them, and all implemented as form fields. Yeah. Because why not? Because why not? And uh, yeah. yeah, why not? <laughs> and you can tie it all into the store, so your whole it mm. makes your whole UI reactive, responsive, and declarative. Because you can just say, okay, give me a new section, and inside the section, I want a file tree, or I want to have an input, or mm. or anything. So you can you can really uh, do this do this interesting way. I haven't published it yet, but I I aim to add this also to Bones for Playgrounds because I think it's a nice. It's a nice place to have. That would be really cool to see. Yeah, I really, I really want to get into your playground now. Eventually, <laughs> just to just to see you play around with forms um, and see how how exactly you're doing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That cool. Very... Definitely, de definitely check it out. I'm happy to come on and 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 like we can even think about like let's add some example because yeah. everybody is well if you have like an example that we didn't cover some specific use case that's nice like wizard is another pattern that we have 
Mm. We have a, a, a CRUD thing, which is to do. So we have recursion, which is the workflow. Yeah. We're definitely open to seeing other patterns. Like if you have any ideas, come on BLS and we're going to implement it together. I'll let you steer. I'll let you, yeah, I'll let you steer and I'll navigate. Nice. Hey man, I, I'd be down for that. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, let, let, let me know. We'll, we'll, we'll talk after, we'll talk after this. We'll figure out some time for me to get on. This sounds like yeah. a really cool way to learn some cool stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and this uh, definitely, I learned a ton by doing BLS. Thanks to you being an inspiration and thanks to Brandon Roberts being an inspiration and uh, Jorge Cano. These were the three people that invited me on their stream like within well, a month. Yeah, dude, that, that's a rarefied air to be on <laughs> with, with Jorge and, uh, and uh, Brandon. Yeah, so man. I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled. Thank you, though. <laughs> oh, awesome. No, totally. You're, and you're also the name giver to my, my project. So that's, that's also cool. But I learned a ton of things and I, I got so much better in doing my job. Yeah. And it got way more fun just by understanding, having a better understanding of the tools I'm using, but yeah. also being inspired. I had like Brian Love on there with lookout.dev, how he mm. did it. I got, um, um, well, various people on there showing me their apps, working with them. And uh, it's a it's super nice way to learn new stuff. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about mastery in our line of work. And I, I think we, you've kind of touched on this a couple of times, just an, an iteration, iterations mm -hmm. and iterations of yeah. working with different patterns, seeing what works and figuring out what doesn't work with that pattern, finding ways around it. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out ways of jumping that cycle <laughs> as much as I can. Yeah. I, I, I have, so I have five, six, six years of experience now in software development. And, you know, I got started late. I'm always looking for ways that I can try to jump that. And I think like yeah. having conversations like this, figuring out from other people, hey, what have you learned from, yeah. from your, you know, however many years of doing this? What's, what's, what's patterns you've seen? And just realizing too, like, I feel like there's this merry-go-round we're going yeah. around in, in tech, right? Where every, I don't know, like seven years or so, like the same stuff comes back around, but yes. it's like repackaged. But I think each time around, there's like, you iterate on the tools and the tools become that much better. And um, I think I that think, in uh, itself may, may be, maybe make, make it worth to stay on the merry-go-round, even though you're just going to end up kind of back where you started eventually. I, don't I, think, know, but... I totally agree with that sentiment. And um, I think a great example is what came out this week. I think hotwire.dev got published, which is from the creators of Hey, Hey.com. Yeah. Which is in turn by the creators of Basecamp and the creators of Ruby on Rails. And what they say, hey, we let you send HTML over the wire instead of JSON. And a lot of people were like, ah, oh, this is what we did 10 years before we went into SPAs, we sent HTML over the wire. Like, what oh, a no. great HTML idea. HTML over the wire? What? <laughs> Why is that? Like, it's like HTTP or something? Yeah, it's, like, it's some sort of XML flavor. We're really going to go back? I know. Oh, turns out we are. And like, what's all is new again? What's all this new again? Yeah. I think that's, that's a recurring pattern. And not only in tech, but it's probably more obvious in tech because you can see the patterns. Mm. I've been using, I've been working in tech for like 20 years and I started out as a system engineer. So I was super mm. excited about operating systems and how these things work together. And I worked at a big university and we had like a plethora of, of OSs. It was like a dream to, to be around. Like you have all these old systems that need to keep maintained and mm. um, archaic systems like AS400, which is like, it's not even Unix. It's like a, a Unix-ish flavor. Mm. And um now, young me, I was super excited about, about VMware at some point and uh, virtualization, desktop virtualization, running two desktops on the same machine. And that this was before server virtualization came, as, yeah. as, but naive me thought it. So I was super excited. And at some point we could do this. And I was totally excited. And then my most senior colleague, he was like 60 or something. He was like, ah, this is exactly what we did in the 60s, like time sharing on a, on a mainframe. I was like, what yep. do you mean? Yeah, well, we would slice a piece of resources and you could run your own operating system. I was like, wow, you could do this for like 30 years already. It's like, yeah. oh, dude, you, you don't even know. This is yeah. like, and this is one of the things, it's exactly what you say. It's like the new stuff Yeah, comes comes new stuff to the table and it, it it's awesome. Right yeah. now, like 2020, I haven't touched a VM 
or maybe in the last year I touched like two or three to experiment something, but everything's Docker because right now yeah. it's like, yeah, why, why spin up a whole VM? I just run Docker, new container, fresh, don't need to think about it. Yeah. But it's super nice. It's like a reincarnation of the same dream, same ideals, same yeah. things we needed, but yeah. packaged in a way better way. And, uh, and the tooling is that much better. That that's yeah. what that's the big pattern I'm seeing. It's like yeah. same same principle, same same exact principle. Just tooling is that much better for it. So yeah. that's very cool. And also like uh, just getting to what you were saying too. Like there, I'm convinced there's all these gems lost, <laughs> lost oh, yeah. in, in in history that like yeah. people 30 years ago, 40 years ago knew about in computer science just theoretically. That we have like we they 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 didn't make it like on one of these trips around the carousel and now we just very few people remember them i think there's yeah. a lot to be dredged up from that like um x state um uh, something state, i was very interested finite in. state machines yeah yeah it's a yeah. it's a finite automata it's uh, like this is this is uh i took a course on this in uh in college, I thought I would never use again. It turns out yeah. to be like extremely relevant in my first job, which was pretty much all state machines. But there's a whole like there's a whole discipline of like learning how to be good at that and like just it, it gets to like the very basics of computing too, like something being yeah. Turing complete and like yeah. it's it's very interesting to think about. But the like the the answers are there. I just I just need to be better at reading about them so I can learn them yeah. and like repackage them into new content. That's that's my goal. <laughs> no, I but. totally agree. And and there's so much like accumulated knowledge but we don't even use it all. Yeah. Like I think at some point and this is not a this is not a new thing, if you look at a global scale, if if your life gets worse, as long as it is lasts long enough, you don't really know or remember what, how it was before. Maybe the pandemic is an example of this. Mm. Like we've been this for almost a year. Like it's kind of hard to realize how it was, right? If if I see a photo of some some group of people, like oh, they're not wearing masks. Yeah, I know. So this was like 2018. Oh, okay, they're, they're standing a little fine. close together, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> It's like our life. I think we can objectively say it got worse uh, mm. in these kind of things. It got less naive. It got more worried about stuff. But yet mm. again, like yeah, we've been in here for a while. I think like three years down the line, we're not longer really thinking about this. Now this yeah. is a bit of a dramatic thing to to touch on, maybe. But like when we went from um, basically all server side generated code, at some point SBAs became a thing, and we all started uh, embracing in. And we're now maybe five to 10 years down the line. And we're still trying to fix issues like doing server-side render properly and fast and doing it good. Something we get for free back in the days. Yeah. One, one of the sites well, we- It was the, the thing back in the day, right? <laughs> it was like my PHP sites were all server-side rendered. So I didn't have to do yeah. anything. That was the, the, the thing I had. And then yeah. <laughs> I would add some Ajax logic and some WebSocket maybe if I was fancy, but that's about it probably some polling mechanism and yeah. uh, I really like seeing where this goes with these new tools moving stuff back react uh, server components are super yeah. interesting to uh, think about and uh, yeah we're reinventing the same thing that was already there I hope it's it gets better and I hope we don't lose a lot of the, uh, of the yeah I absolutely I, I do think there's a lot of value though in, in getting that perspective I don't know if I would have been able to see a couple of years ago just like Hey, we used to do this, right? Yeah. <laughs> so no, I, I yeah. personally, I love writing JavaScript and I love doing um, front end development. Mm. Like when I started out, there wasn't front end and back end. There was just like you were a developer. Like yeah. if you if you output HTML, you're a web developer. But other, yeah. you're just a developer. Otherwise, I think we've grown a lot, and I really hope that to see some some fancy uh, fancy stuff over the next years makes it even even more amazing. Yeah. Any big predictions for 2021? Kind of clickbaity, but... Uh, any predictions for 2021? Um, I think, like, from a technical point of view, I think uh, Tailwind is going to keep on growing. I really yeah. hope, hope to see that. Uh, I can see NX move big into the uh, React space. I think the React team is... The NX team is doing a small, a smart move there, like addressing those folks. Yeah. I've converted like uh, two or three projects to NX that were, weren't on their pure React shops and they all love it. And they, 
I apply the same logic and structure I have in my Angular apps. So there's like, oh, this is so super easy to, like they finally have some structure to work with, which is great. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, oh, other I, than also that, to hear too, though. <laughs> like, uh, with, yeah, man. No. I, I'm, I'm trying to get more, I'm trying to uh, bone up more on React stuff to, to try to, I feel like there's, there's so much untapped stuff there, especially for NX, you know, and just trying to, uh, trying to make sure it's a, uh, what we have is a good fit for, um, yeah. you know, for, for what their needs actually are. So I did, um, over the weekend, a project with, uh, Nest, Nest and Prisma on the back end, Angular on the front end and React Native as a mobile platform in the same oh, NX wow. workspace. So I, I took a shot at the uh, React Native, but I just played with it, but now I build a, a real app in it and yeah. the integration is super well done. I think, um, Probably most credit to Jack. Uh, yeah. Awesome work there. It's uh, it's super well, and the rest of the whole team for supporting it. But uh, yeah, I love it. And this was one of the things I, I'm doing React Native. I did it always outside of it. And people are like, you're the monorepo guy. Why don't you put it in? Like, just wait till the integration is there. And we'll, we'll port it over at some point. Yeah. Uh, super glad I waited. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you got some good use out of that. I, I need to jump into React Native a little bit too here soon. I've been I've been doing the Kenzie Dodds uh, Epic React course. So how is that? I I've, I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I feel like uh, for most of the lessons, I kind of go off the beaten path and just start playing with different things, trying to understand it. React for me is like it's it's um, it's like I'm taking the same problem. And I'm solving it in much the same way, but I'm I'm taking that problem and maybe rotating it like 15 degrees, maybe mm -hmm. like not an, not enough that it feels foreign, but enough that I have to think differently to solve it. And I feel like it's it's super helpful in terms of just like creating new pathways, like new neural pathways in my brain yeah. to to kind of help deal with these things. Yeah. Um. I definitely I definitely like to explore it a little bit more. Um, thinking about, for example, RxJS and React, um, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, it feels like in many ways you don't need RxJS and React. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to come up with a way to articulate why exactly that is. Um, but yeah, um, I'm, I'd be interested. So, so you do a lot of stuff in React, right? Do you have it's any, like 50, have 50. Opinion? yeah. Do you have any opinions of RxJS and React? I, so I got into React when it started out with class-based uh, React, and uh, I really yeah. liked the idea of having a life cycle, and that's a very easy thing to ma to wrap my head around. Okay, you have like hooks when something starts, something fires. You can set things up and tear them down, right? And uh, which is what I did in Angular as well. These yeah. days, I don't see myself using. I hardly use the engine on it. I sometimes do it to initialize a store, but yeah. uh, other than that, I don't really use it anymore. Neither engine destroy because I don't subscribe, so I don't need to unsubscribe. Yeah. So my need in Angular got less. In React, we moved to most of the world moves to function based components, yeah. which which is a definitely a sweet thing to have. I really yeah. really like the idea of have just a function return anything, yeah. execute it. I would yeah. love for this to exist in Angular, but yeah. I understand the practicalities why this is not a thing. Right. Or I think I understand them, but. I'm not sure, but uh, the yeah. Well, the the composability, like so, so React hooks, like in general, mm -hmm. like the 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 various ones, like um, create effect, create reducer, create yeah. or create use state. state, use state. That's right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm saying it wrong with each one of these. Use state, use effect, use reducer. Like yeah. these are all like uh, very cool tools to have by themselves. But seeing those and then like being able to say, hey, I'm just going to take those and compose my own React hook on the spot right here in like 10 lines, <laughs> maybe, you know, yeah. that's that's super cool. That's like taking that idea of like, hey, whatever service we're going to have, I actually don't need a service. I just need this function <laughs> yeah. and we're just yeah, going to yeah. drop this in and like everything's going to work. And it's I don't know that there seems like a lot of power in that. I'd love to get better at that. You know, um, I think. The biggest thing I enjoy about our work is thinking about these problems about state and um, being able to have like a different tool set to attack those problems. I've, I, I really enjoy the challenge of just thinking about 
things that way and just taking like a 15 degree turn on on all this yeah. stuff and seeing how to how to make it all work so i really yeah. like the idea of uh, hooks as well and i've i've actually looked at it and i think i implemented it so i was doing the uh, not even behavior subject subject in the service i was seeing myself having subjects in my components just for triggering a refresh oh yeah oh yeah and uh so okay just put put a next next true to this refresh uh behavior subject and observe it and i was mm -hmm. like okay, this three three lines of code with a setter it's six lines of code and uh, you can actually do this in a um you can just have a decorator that does this mm. so i would have a use refresh decorator and mm. uh Tack it onto one of these these things. Now the downside yeah. is, and I think the I, by now I know the answer, but the downside is you don't get any um, uh, intelligence that way. So it doesn't really uh, triple down what you're actually doing with this um, with this property, and it, intelligence doesn't work. And I think the answer to this is to use a method like create reducer, where you basically say create create refresh hook mm. or create refresh tiggy. Something yeah. like this, because if you return a method, you can do this, and if you do, if you just decorate it, you don't. Yeah. Uh, but I found myself doing this, which is which is super nice. But in the end, I got rid of it because it's it's definitely not um, idiomatic Angular to do this kind of on the fly decorator column use refresh. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, it was nice that it could, but then I I moved, and these days I frankly don't don't need it because behavior right. uh, component store and. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing I definitely used a lot of subjects in with my components was like, um, if I actually had something that was listening to ng on changes, right? I just have right. something set up in there, some private subject, and its only job was to take on, on changes lifecycle hooks and just like, give me an observable of what those inputs actually were, instead of just yeah. having a, a, a property. I wish that came out of the box. It doesn't make sense that they're not that way out of the box. But I feel like it's a, a lot of that's a product of just like not like RxJS. I don't fully comprehend it now. I don't fully like. Uh, I'm close, maybe. I, I yeah. feel like I'm closer than than most people. But I think you are. Oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks. But like even at, at the time when when Angular first came out, I don't think I don't think anyone was there. Maybe, yeah, maybe no. like Ben Lesh or, or like the people working on RxJS. But yeah. like yeah, it, it should have been that way from the beginning. But I yeah, think it's that, easy enough to to throw them that way. But the subject just seems like the easiest way to do that. So yeah. I think it's uh, it's one of the most uh, voted for issues on the Angular repo. Have uh, mm. inputs being observable and. Yeah. Um, Angular team is is basically on the on the line of okay we're gonna either go full in all and make it all observable or we're just gonna make it all optional. But right now there's just some some places it might not make sense for for one coming to Angular like hey why isn't this one another interesting one app initializer the app initializer you can run an app initialization mm -hmm. doesn't support an observable you need to have a promise so mm. this kind of come. <laughs> I was like, what? Take and one, two, promise. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, dude, how did you get in there? Well, like, <laughs> nice. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And these are kind of things. And there's there's a few others, I think, but... Um, well, I, I, I've had this thing on Twitter recently. I'm questioning, like, some of these things in Angular that do take observables, I don't think should. Um, yeah. Like route guards, for example. It's super confusing to have those as an observable. Especially because behind the scenes, Angular is going and take, doing a first on that observable. So, it, but they, it's very hard to figure that out. Like, and it's no. hard, it's almost even hard to make a comment about that. Like you can have maybe some IntelliSense about this being like, hey, if you're doing an observable, make sure you only have it emit the one time or the only one you care about being that one time. Cause like just the nature of it being an observable makes you think, well, maybe if I make this, if I admit true initially, and then maybe somewhere down the line, like say if the user logs out, then I'll, I'll go ahead and admit a false. Maybe that will kick the user out, like yeah, like yeah, you would yeah. expect from a rock guard. But no, that that doesn't happen at all. So part of me wishes it would only take a promise in that situation. If it's only going to expect one thing, anyways, that's just yeah. it's like taking all the dimensions that come from RxJS and like just flattening it down into one, right? Yeah. Like uh, our, maybe an observable is like a uh, what's the right word for this? Like a poly. 
a polygon mm -hmm. and a promise is a square right yeah like yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a promise is a, so a square is just like a very well-defined polygon and sometimes yeah. that's what you want like not yeah. all the time you probably want a lot of places where you can just take a polygon but sometimes you just want a square and you, because yeah. you then you know exactly what to expect right so but i think I don't know. In, in general this is what makes the decision so hard because i'm mm. i probably in the camp of like yeah let's make inputs observable by default yeah. yes let's Let's do that. And uh, I'm fine with that. I'm even mm -hmm. fine with another syntax. Let's call them like, or whatever. Just just figure something out. You can distinguish them. But yeah. uh, there's a, probably a lot of places where it really doesn't make that much sense to have them. And if, if you want to go all in, add them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, interesting. And there's another thing that, that um, was brought to my attention by one of the members of the Angular Discord. And... Um, he, uh, this person comes from React, and they're like, "Ah, oh, you, if you make an input required, you cannot make an input required in Angular app. It will not throw an error if you, if you not provide an input that is, like, not hmm. optional and not initialized. Like, if you if you had a question mark, that's fine. You have an optional one, or if you provide a default value, sure, mm -hmm. you you comply to this this contract basically. But it's not strongly typed. This thing, and it came to my attention, and indeed the props in react are in fact if you use react with typescript which you probably should then um you you will it will scream at you when you don't provide an input which is kind of nice mm. kind of interesting to look at like the, the the strongly typed one by default out of the box doesn't have these kind of checks which is interesting so yeah i'll be excited to see that one uh, in strict mode maybe yeah yeah, TypeScript is one of those things I really want to get better at in 2021. Um, I yeah, feel like what I have your... a decent grasp on it. But... you have any other, other big plans for 2021? I'm still trying to figure it out. As of the time of this recording, we've got, what, like three more days left in 2020? So Something, like a yeah. small week? Yeah. It's not 20, I don't worry. Okay, yeah, four yeah, days. Yeah. Four days. There we go. So I got time. I still got time, Rob. <laughs> but yeah, just... um, I, I'm wanting to do, I, I'm trying to get myself to a, a consistent uh, uh, pattern, I think. I, I'm really, I think the, the biggest thing for me is going to be um, wanting to produce more. So having actual production in terms of, you know, uh, both my life at Narwhal and contracting for our clients at Narwhal yeah. and putting out content and, um, yeah, just, uh, and also contributing to OSS. And I feel like I, I need, I need to focus that down a little bit because there's a lot of stuff in there yeah. and I want to, I want to be able to, I don't know, maybe focus on, on, uh, on something there, maybe just focus on content, or maybe even just focus on narwhal stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 still trying to piece it together. But I definitely want to uh, want to get better uh, in general at mastery of our line of work. Is trying trying to like I said, kind of <laughs> trying to do whatever I can to jump that that learning curve as best as I can, and uh, yeah. You know, get into whatever echelon, like get up there with the Victors and the Brandons and the and the Brahms of of the world. Dude, that's <laughs> that's too much honor being that list. But thanks. <laughs> no, I think uh, sharing it uh, helps a ton. You probably realize this as well. Talking to mm. a lot of people about our job and and how they do this, I think this is a is a great way. And then, yeah, yeah. keep up the good cool. stuff. And I, I imagine with Narwhal, you must see some interesting projects as well. Lots of interesting projects. It's a lot of a lot of stretching, <laughs> I feel like, in terms of just like, I, I kind of thought when I first signed up, it would be a lot of, well, you know how to do an app. Let's just iterate on that over and over. But it's yeah. been it's been more of like, let's get let's get the really hard stuff, <laughs> yeah. which which is good, I think, in terms of trying to jumpstart that learning curve as much as possible. But yeah. Definitely. I, I definitely enjoy that work. Well, what are your what are your resolutions for 2021? Do you have any? So um, work-wise, I try to work less and do more awesome stuff like content creation and being mm. out there doing open source and Discord. So I, I always consider my contracts, with all respect to my contract, the, the one I'm contracting for, but it's like source of income. And mm. uh, once, I'm, once I hit a certain threshold, I generally stop taking new contracts and start working a few months. So I kind of yeah. divide this. I hope to continue this in 2021. 
And um, but there's some nice things working on that I'm working on. We're gonna do some more stuff on the native script playground, which is awesome. Uh, which is gonna cool. be probably rebuilt in Angular using an X. I got a demo. Think about the file tree I was building. I, I'm not doing this just out of nowhere. This is the, the app I'm I'm building that for. Nice. <laughs> so and then another thing that's that's interesting to note. So you know I I start I founded the foundation Code Your Future Colombia in 2018. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have been, we've been, became independent since I think November or something, October. I'm not, not sure the exact date. It doesn't really matter. Um, but we've, uh, we've, we've basically, we've grown up and uh, we've stepped outside the house of our parents. We said goodbye. We gave them a hug and uh, we're going to move as an independent nice. foundation. Yeah, pretty nice. We hope to, to get more speed, more leverage and... Um, there were quite a few restric restrictions in England that apply to us being part of the foundation. Mm. Think about privacy laws and um, like financial requirements for foundations are super strict there. Oh, Here yeah. in Colombia, not so much. And uh, mm. once you're basically registered, you can just move on without having to worry too much about uh, paperwork, Yeah, which is uh, what I prefer. Mm. So that's super interesting. We started and it's called Bsoft Labs. Uh, one of the students uh, uh, came up with the name uh, he wanted to have my name in 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 the project in the in the foundation, so that's awesome. Very cool. <laughs> and uh, he's one of the <clears throat> the graduates, actually, one of the old students, and uh, they're they're currently volunteering. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is um, I'm going to do live content in Spanish on YouTube on this YouTube channel from Bsoft Labs. So I did my first episode there. Uh, so that's pretty uh, exciting. Uh, that's doing, awesome, making content man. in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. And I was always like, ah, my Spanish is not good enough. And everybody, that's bullshit. And you could just do it. <laughs> part of my French. But uh, yeah, so I started doing it and it, it seems like it works. So that's cool. Uh, so that's one thing I'm super excited about. A lot of new energy there. And um, what I'm also going to do, so with, with our foundation, uh, Coach Your Future before, now Bsoft Labs, our students follow a certain pathway or a certain route, if you will, like that mm -hmm. takes them from zero to some point. For instance, uh, intro to coding gives you HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And then there are certain levels that people need to do. And we formulated, these are the missions. You have to, uh, you have, you get a mission assigned, so you have to do this mission, several tasks. So go to Free Code Camp, do this, show mm -hmm. us your certificate. And then go back to this site, show us your certificate. And I build a platform for that, Connect the Mind. And oh, connect nice. the mind, somebody can go in and can uh, basically have a mission assigned to them and can finish it. And some other person can review your mission submission. So think about mentor, mentee. We have mentors and a new new student comes on and they apply and they, they do content. And then one of the mentors goes in and checks, okay, this is good or gives feedback if it's not good. Hmm. So that's pretty nice. And um, I got software. I'm, I'm working on software to doing this. We're actually in production already. And... Um, I want to take this to us to the next level and basically offer these kind of um, these kind of missions, but without having the guidance, without having our guidance. And the benefit is like it doesn't take any of our time. Maybe mm. maybe somewhere someone in the community wants to help you, but we don't commit to helping an individual student out. Whereas with the other students, these are like our kids or our pets. I think mm. pets and cattle is a is a great comparison. These ones are our pets, so we need to take care of them. We know their name. We love them. We pet them. We we feed them. Whereas the other one, the kettle, is just there for the purpose. Like it's there. <laughs> it's basically anonymous. We like them. We appreciate them, but we don't really go into depth with helping them. And then yeah, you don't name them. <laughs> we don't name them. They just have a number. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And uh, <laughs> if one signs off, we say thank you very much. It was great having you. And then mm. well, that's that's. I think that's a great comparison. So. Yeah. We want to we wanna reach more people, but we cannot do the same thing with the foundation. Like giving people a laptop is yeah. really only feasible if it's local to where we are. So we can, right. like, we don't have to ship hardware and stuff like this. So this is a very practical thing. Yeah. Like uh, pre-COVID and hopefully within like one year, we can do meetings again. And, and we like to meet people and, and uh, take them out for dinner, for instance, as, a, yeah. as a, to get to know. So this is with the pets and then with the kettle. We help for every Spanish-speaking person in the world so they can always go into Connect to Mind, Beast of Labs, take missions. And my, my dream is that this will become a community effort and there's enough people in the community that are willing to review work done by somebody else that they yeah. probably don't know. 
so yeah, that's what I'm super excited about and connect the mind. The goal is to be um, more open. So the goal is that you can make your uh, uh, ZDS community, if you like, where you can invite people and share content and at some point, at some moment, even monetize it. So you can say, mm. you know what? I got this course. You're in my CDS community. Uh, I got this course here and you can get it for free or you can get the advanced course and uh, mm. do some payment. Yeah. So this is Very all cool. what I'm what I'm working on. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. Well, dude, for uh, for this work you're doing with now BSoft Labs and Connect to Mind and for all like the awesome community contributions you do. You've been a real inspiration to me in terms of wanting to do more in terms of OSS and just more more content, more stuff for the community. It's it's really Thanks, awesome man. to have this relationship where we're able to have these conversations every now and then. I'm looking forward to being on uh, BLS and you teaching me yeah. some stuff about component store and forms. That that's going to be super cool. So sounds awesome, man. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Thanks a lot for the kind works and and for having me again. It's yep. uh, it's been super nice. Dude, together we're we're gonna jump we're gonna jump the line together, man. <laughs> We're going to break the YouTube at the front. Path together. There you go. <laughs> Sweet. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, if you search for this, Beam and Dev and YouTube, people can follow me. But I think most people that are following you already know about my person as well and vice versa. So, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll be sure to put all these links up on the on the YouTube when it goes out. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Everyone check all that stuff out. Beam man's great. And he's done a lot of stuff for NX. He's done a lot of stuff for the community in general. Big thumbs up. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Sweet. Well, we'll sign off on that note. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye.